You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. Praying via a specific ritual format does not necessarily mean that God hears, okay? What He wants is our heart. He doesn't want us to pray the same thing. We could even turn the Lord's Prayer into ritual, and people do. Jesus says in Matthew 6, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so they can be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go in your inner room, close your door and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Traditions do not necessarily guarantee us certain results. Just because we pray a certain prayer, eat certain foods, or go to church on a specific day does not mean we're guaranteed a relationship with Jesus. Those things are important if the Lord uses and guides you in that direction, but only if He, the Lord, directs it. In today's message, Pastor Ken will encourage you to simply be a Christian. No fancy rules or regulations, Simply, faithfully, and increasingly follow Jesus with all that you are. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, as he continues his message, Israel Indicted. You know, Satan likes it when we're religious. He really does, because there's no relationship there. But we still see the grace of God here, because as the city is likened to Sodom and to Gomorrah, they haven't been destroyed yet there's still an opportunity for them to repent and return to the Lord and come back to Yahweh. They still need to give ear to the instruction of the Lord. They need to get back to their Torah. They need to see what's in there. They need to make sure that they're reading Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and following what it actually says. And what's the response of the nation? What's the response of Judah? Look at our ceremonies. Don't we have great ceremonies? The problem that the nation is experiencing is the same one that we tend to fall into from time to time as well. They were just going through the motions. We do that from time to time too. The danger is is that if you do communion too frequently, you start falling into motions with communion instead of taking it seriously as to what it really is, a representation of what Jesus did for us on the cross. I've actually sat through services at one of those groups that do the really fancy services and it, it was just kind of like rote. Uh, there was no nobody really had their heart in it at all. Uh, and I've also been, well, I don't know if you call it privileged or not, but when I was assigned in the Middle East, I got caught and got stuck when it was time to turn to Mecca. And they were very serious and very religious as well and completely and totally lost. And I, I just remember sitting there and watching as all of these men faced Mecca and got on their knees and, and were bowing down, and they're bowing down to Satan. And, and you're just going, you know, they're so lost. They need the Lord. And yet the, the Holy Spirit's showing me, saying, well, what do you do that's the same? Okay. You know, they, they had turned a relationship into a rote. It was just, it was just <laughs> and it was, it was not even with God at all. So that's a problem. Going through the, going through the motions, that's what the nation was. So we come to verse 11 here in chapter 1. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me? The Lord's going to ask him some questions. Because they're saying, look at all that we do. We have the temple. We do all this stuff. God says, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me? Says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. Now, incense is a type of prayer, and, he, and God's saying, you haven't meant any of it. It's an abomination. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity in a solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I'm going to hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. God wants relationship. He doesn't want ceremony. He wants a right heart. He doesn't want ten Hail Marys and a couple of novenas. Okay? He does not want somebody to light a candle and walk away. He wants somebody to be involved in serving and talking to him and following what it is that he has to do. He does not want empty religion. 
they forgot that God intended those ceremonies. And, if, and, and when we studied through Leviticus and Numbers, it, it's not just about barbecue. There's, there's something behind all of those ceremonies. And they all point to Jesus. They all point to what the Lord is going to accomplish. So their attitude was more important than their flawless performance of, of worship rituals. But they, they were making sure they got those rituals done correctly. So here they are, wicked people, but they're doing these really fancy devotions, pompous, costly. I mean, a bull is not cheap. You know, we used to joke that you could tell when your neighbor, if you were living in, in Israel at that time, if you were having a sin problem, they'd start watching your herd get smaller because you were trying to figure out what to do about that sin. You just had to keep repenting. What God's interested in, and David says it over and over again, is a reformed heart and a reformed life. Otherwise, they're an abomination to him. And that's what God's saying. They've turned into that. They've turned into an abomination. Now, the answer that God gives them is not a religious answer. Remember, Jesus talked about folks who were being very, very religious, and they're going to show up at the great white throne judgment and say, I did this for you, and I did that for you, and I, I did all these different things for you. And we see that in Luke 13 and in Matthew 7. And Jesus went on to say that his response to those who were performance-oriented and not into relationship is summed up in one sentence. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. He's not interested in, in making sure that it's done right. He wants the heart to be right. There's blood on Judah's hands. So here's some background about Judah. Because we have to understand, well, what kind of blood are we talking about? The southern kingdom, what, 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 what have they been doing? Some of these are coming events uh, that we haven't gotten to yet. But where are their hearts? We're going to find out that King Ahaz practiced, he's the third king of that list that's in verse 1. Um, he practiced child sacrifice and the people followed. Uh, he worshipped Moloch and killed babies. Israel and Syria attacked Jerusalem and kill 100,000 and take 200,000 captive. So King Ahaz turns around and bribes the Assyrians to take care of Israel in Syria. Notice it's Syria, not Assyria. So Assyria, Syria and Israel attack and kill all those people and take the captives. So Ahaz, who's the king of Judah, bribes the Assyrians to deal with Israel in Syria so the Assyrians take Israel and Syria into captivity. Because Ahaz bribed him to do that. And then Assyria moves, of course, into Israel. Syria and Israel have been attacked, destroyed, and the survivors went off into exile by the Assyrians. Yeah, there's blood on their hands. Non-Jews were then reforcibly settled into the northern portion of the land, which later became known as Samaria, and they became Samaritans. That's where it all began. As part of that deal, Ahaz became a vassal to the Assyrian Empire, and he instituted the worship of their gods in the temple and to include child sacrifice. Of course, King Hezekiah, who was the king after Ahaz, rebelled against Assyria. God then delivered Jerusalem through a miracle, but all of Judah other than Jerusalem was taken prisoner by the Assyrians. So with that background, we come back to the reality of where the people of Judah actually are. Many are following Yahweh because it's politically correct. Under Hezekiah there's a revival, and after Manasseh, under Josiah, there'll be a revival, but there are many who didn't have their hearts in it. And we're going to find out with Hezekiah, the priests who didn't even have their hearts in it. The Levites did, but not the priests. We'll have more of it to come. In James chapter 1, verses 22 to 24, and this is, this is what they're not doing. But be sure to you live out the message and do not merely listen to it, and so deceive yourselves. In other words, we do what the Bible says. We, we do what the Lord asks us to do. For if someone merely listens to the message and does not live it out, he's like someone who gazes at his own face in the mirror. He gazes at himself and goes out and immediately forgets what sort of person he was. So because of where this nation is spiritually, God has to outline what the problem is. He provides the reason why in verse 15. He tells them that when you spread out your hands in prayer, when they're praying with their hands up like this, he says, I'm going to hide my eyes from you. Even though you multiply prayers, you know, in other words, they say the same thing over and over and over again. They have a ritual prayer. I'm not going to listen because all you can see is all this other stuff that we just talked about, the blood that's on their hands. They haven't repented. The, the babies who were sacrificed to Moloch, all those who were killed through the duplicity of King Ahaz, they haven't repented. 
Dr. Roskup says this, he says, false worshipers pace themselves through dead ritual in two ways. One is the movement of their hands as they pray, in, in other words, beads, okay, just saying. And the other is multiplication of prayers. What is it that you pray when you move a, move a bead? Same thing over and over and over. They spread out their hands before God as if sincerely seeking Him, but deny the gesture by their real disloyalties. This was a problem in Israel too, and definitely in the southern kingdom. So God's condemning their prayer due to the blood on their hands, but also due to the dead ritual that the prayer doesn't mean anything. They're spreading their hands, lifting up their arms in prayer and worship, and they thought that because they're doing that they were good. Hey, I came to church, I lifted up my hands, I prayed, I, I'm good. And then you get on the interstate and try and run me over. Like everybody does, but that's a different deal. Praying via a specific ritual format does not necessarily mean that God hears. Okay? What He wants is our heart. He doesn't want us to pray the same thing. We could even turn the Lord's Prayer into ritual. And people do. Jesus says in Matthew 6, when you pray you're not to be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so they can be seen by men. Truly I say to you they have their reward in full. But you when you pray go in your inner room, close your door and pray to your Father who's in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you're praying do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. They suppose they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So for Judah who's now in the courtroom, and for who there is still a chance, what is required for them so that they don't wind up like the north? What does God want? We see that next, and it can be summed up in one word. Repentance. That's what God wants. God makes an invitation. He's going to do a settlement offer. But He's going to do this with a series of imperatives. In other words, commands. This is what they have to do. The nation pays attention to their sin individually. It will actually result in outward deeds reflecting the believing loyalty. But here's what God says in verse 16 and 17. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. And plead for the widow. Nine imperatives in, that, in those two verses. Wash. Make a deliberate decision and then take action on that decision. In other words, repent. Make. Avail yourself of what the Lord has already provided. You know, For the Jew it was avail yourself of the ordinances that are there. For us, avail yourself of Jesus. He's already taken care of it. Remove. Take the evil deeds and take them from God's sight. That's what He does. He, when we give our life to Jesus He removes them. They're gone. Cease. Stop the way that you've been living. That's what he's telling the nation. You've got to stop living this way. Then he tells them to learn. Start learning how to live differently. Seek. Make living differently a priority. Reprove. Speak out against the culture. That's what he's talking about. Defend. And this is leading to actions that, that you're going to show up because you trust him, you follow him, then you start doing things and it starts reflecting in your day-to-day -day life. So you speak out against the culture, reprove, defend, you let your life reflect the change in you and you wind up defending things that other people may not defend. Plead, that means actively standing for what is right. And that's tough. I remember sitting down and talking with people at lunch and they just sit there and go, well this is what it is, Ken. And I'm like, that's wrong. You know, it's just wrong. You can't, what do you mean this is, oh it's wrong. It's, this is, this is, you know, you just don't understand. Yeah, I do understand. God's grace is reflected here in these two verses. His grace is there and His invitation follows in verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they'll be like wool. If you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land, but if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. Truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I really like the way the Net Bible has this translation. He's making an offer of settlement, okay, before he moves forward with the indictment. He says, here's your opportunity. Here's what you got to do so that you don't have to listen to and go through the rest of what I'm about to talk about. So the Net Bible says, come, let's consider your options, says the Lord. Though your sins have stained you like the color red, you could become white like snow. Though they're easy to see as the color scarlet, 
you can become white like wool. If you have a willing attitude and obey, then you'll again eat the good crops of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. Know for certain that the Lord has spoken. God's telling Judah, don't force me to render judgment. Settle your case out of court. Don't go the rest of the way on this. Or the way we used to, to deal with it in uh, insurance work, this is a one-time good deal. This is an offer. I'm only going to offer it this one time. Please take it. Because there's no guarantee once this goes into the courtroom, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. You have no idea what the jury's going to say. You just don't know. And, and I've made offers of settlement in the past where people have taken it and they just, they're, they're happier than anything and the court case is over. And I've also had people who have rejected it and then the, the jury comes back and doesn't believe a word they said. And all of a sudden it's kind of like, well, now I want your offer. Sorry, we've got a jury ward now. The judge has, has spoken. That's the thing. The judge has spoken. That opportunity is gone. So that's what, that's what God's doing here. He's saying, let's talk this over a little bit. Let me show you the advantages of what believing loyalty are. The contract you agreed to was the right decision. And you can come back to that place of initial agreement. There is a way out no matter how bad you've been and how far you've drifted. You can be just like white, fresh white snow on the ground. By the way, all the offers being made here are in the imperfect in the Hebrew, which means that they indicate capability or possibility, but it's conditional. In other words, you have to do something. This could happen, but you've got to make a decision. It's a conditional offer. You know, the offer's conditional. In other words, there's going to have to be some skin in this game. You're going to have to make some decisions. Now, God makes the offer, and then he ultimately backs it up later, and we'll see it in Isaiah 53 when he talks about the suffering servant. That's how he backs it up. He pays the price himself so that we can be made new. You know, that, and it's, his name is Jesus Christ. You know, there, you know, to put it in terms that I've heard other people say, well, is there a secret sauce? Yeah, there is, and he's telling us about that secret sauce. This is, this is it. It's the same discussion he had with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Jesus said, I tell you the solemn truth, unless a person is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's it. Nicodemus said, well, how can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter the mother's womb and be born a second time, can he? Jesus said, I tell you the solemn truth, unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What's born of the flesh is flesh. What's born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I say to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows wherever it will, and you hear the sound it makes, but do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. Well, Nicodemus said, how can this be? And Jesus answered, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? I tell you the solemn truth. We speak about what we know and testify about what we've seen, but you people do not accept our testimony. If I have told you people about earthly things and you don't believe, how do you believe? I tell you about heavenly things. No one's ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. For this is the way God loved the world. He gave His only, one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world should be saved through Him. The one who believes in Him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the basis for judging that the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light so that their deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the life, to the light so that it may be plainly evident the deeds have been done in God. The settlement offer is still there. You know, we're reading it in Isaiah. This is the settlement offer that Jesus offered. He did it with his life and his resurrection. The offer is still there, but at a point in time that offer ends too. For the Jew, believing loyalty meant repenting and following Yahweh. And yeah, they did some rituals, but notice what is not said here. Does it say anywhere in this section of Scripture, go to the temple and do ceremonies. Make sure you, you sacrifice a bull, make sure you sacrifice a dove, doesn't say that, does he? He doesn't point back to the ceremonies at all. He says repent. And there's just a choice that has to be made. 
verses 19 and 20, if you consent, in other words, if you decide yes and obey, you're going to eat the best of the land. In other words, the covenant will be reestablished. It'll be just like it was. We're, we're, you won't be a hut in the middle of an empty field anymore. You'll, you, everything will be different. Then he says, if you refuse and rebel, you're going to be devoured by the sword. Truly the mouth of the Lord is spoken. He said, just say yes, please. Yeah, I mean, you can almost hear the Lord saying, please, please say yes. And follow through on it. In Romans chapter 10, what does the heart say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we're preaching that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. That hasn't changed. There's no ceremony that has to be done. What God's saying in Isaiah chapter 1, he's also saying in Romans chapter 10. The result of saying yes for Judah as it, is, as it is for us, if we say yes, is peace. It's a restoration of the promises associated with being believers, the loyalty, with seeing the believing loyalty in their lives. For some of them have never been there before. It's the same for the, those of us who give our lives to Jesus. Giving our life to Jesus, everything changes. And then we start to see the blessings for the nation that are outlined in Deuteronomy 28, 28 verses 1 to 14, Paul also outlined them for us. He says it's eternal life. That's the blessing. But he says if the nation says no, there'll be no other offer for settlement from this point forward. There will be one later, but not now. And he begins to refer to one of the curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15 to 68. It's the curse in Deuteronomy 28, 25. The Lord shall cause you to be defeated before your enemies, You'll go out one way against them, but you'll flee seven ways before them, and you'll be an example of terror to all the kingdoms of earth. That's what happened. It's called Babylon. That did take place. But here there's some wordplay in the Hebrew. It's kind of interesting. And he says, if you obey, in verse 19, you get to eat. You know, the Hebrew word that's used there. And, 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 but then he says, if you don't obey, if you disobey, the word that he uses in the Hebrew is, you'll be eaten. That's a little different, those two words, when you start looking at it. You can eat or you can be eaten. Easy, easy for me to make a decision based on that one, okay? So we'll get back to the courtroom next week, okay? So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that you offered an alternative for the nation of Judah that they could make a decision to follow you or they could, they could turn. The northern kingdom, was, they, were, they, were, they were done. But Lord, you offered a chance for salvation to the southern kingdom. And Lord, it's, it's the same that you offer to us today. Help us to not neglect the salvation that you so freely offered as a result of what you did on the cross for us, Lord Jesus. We just we want to be in that group that is standing before you and saying hallelujah as we rise to be with you as a result of you calling us to be home with you, Lord. We don't want to be stuck on planet Earth and having to go through everything that we just got finished studying in the book of Revelation that's going to be left for those folks. Lord, we just ask if there's anybody here this evening that doesn't know you, that they would take to heart what it is that we've been saying and that they would give their life to you as a result of what they've heard in your word. Thank you, Lord, for this time in your word. Thank you for the indictment that you're giving to Israel but, because we're learning from it. And help us to continue to learn from your word as we continue to seek you. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The voice you just heard is that of Pastor Ken here on The Unsafe Bible as he's making his way through an Old Testament book of Isaiah. This is one of many teachings in this book, and we trust that the words of Isaiah will encourage you in your own walk of faith. Are you new to hearing the Word of God? Are you still trying to figure out this whole Jesus thing? You know what? That's okay. We all begin somewhere. Are you listening closely? Begin now. We're here for you and would like nothing better than to connect with you. Pretty please with a cherry on top to go to our website? All right, it's the unsafebible.com. And click on the Connect tab. Then click on the Connect card. 
There you'll find a form to fill out. This allows us to get in touch with you. We honestly look forward to speaking with you. If this feels a little overwhelming, we understand. Why not come see firsthand what we're all about? We'd love to have you at one of our services. All information can be found at theunsafebible.com. While you're there, be sure to look around. You can learn more about us and what we believe. Or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. There's also an archive of messages easily organized so that you can find whatever interests you rather quickly. Don't be shy. Stay a while and soak in God's Word. When you're done listening, would you prayerfully consider donating to this ministry? If so, just locate the Give tab to get started. Thank you so much for your support. Our time is about up for today, but we hope you make plans to join us again here on The Unsafe Bible.